Hi, I'm Colin Dean, and today I'm going to talk to you about code review and architecture. This is me. Um, I like to engineer quality software and build events and organizations that help others build quality software. Of course, I have to say this, that my words are my own, not of any of my employers. And also, please save your questions to the end of the presentation. Here's an agenda for the things I'm going to cover. Tell you a quick anecdote about myself. We'll define code review, talk about some of the problems that code review solves, some of the quality attributes, the architectural quality attributes that code review ensures, talk about some good tips that I have for doing code reviews, and of course, some limitations of code reviews. My first experience with getting my work reviewed was as a, uh, a member of the student newspaper in college. First as a copy editor, and later as a layout editor, and eventually rose to become the editor-in-chief of the newspaper for two years. Um, this was, despite being a computer science major, in a sea of English majors at a primarily English college. For about three and a half years, I read everything that was fit to print, and a whole lot that wasn't. Even as the editor writing my own weekly column, nothing that I wrote went into the newspaper without at least one other person, generally three other people, reviewing it for grammar, spelling, and, well, am I actually making sense? Um, no one was exempt from the dreaded red pen, or in these modern times, the record changes feature. This review process saved us several times. Sometimes a student writer would just completely wreck a piece, and we would have to rewrite it or send it back to the writer, call them into our office at 11 o'clock at night and say, hey, this is crap, can you help us fix it? Um, sometimes, just like adding, uh, you know, being the, the committer or the author on a Git log, um, we'd sometimes add our own name to something just to clarify that we had done this work and um, give the student writer some attribution as a, um, a contributor. Sometimes, though, in layout, uh, we would use Xs to mark that something was necessary to be fixed, um, generally as a headline. We, we didn't want to think of a headline um, that might be missed. Uh, so it's easier to just put some Xs. Um, one time, I violated that rule. And uh, my prepress operator calls me up, and she says, hey, take a look at the headline on A8. You'll see it says something like, what the fuck is this shit? It was a picture of a piece of pizza. Um, it made it to pre-press. Bless her heart, calls me and says, hey, you owe me a beer. I've saved your ass again. So I've been doing reviews since, uh, well, way before I got into coding, and uh, well before I know they existed in software. But really, what are they? Let's, let's establish a base for what code review really is. How many of you are familiar with code review? Fantastic. I thought a bit and wrote how I myself define code review. I wrote, code review is the process by which those who maintain a software code base evaluate a proposed change to that code base, regardless of the source of the proposed change. Wikipedia's definition is a little more succinct. Wikipedia says, code review is the systematic examination of computer source code. This definition allows for some broader techniques than I myself prepare to or um, care to participate in. Um, but the similarity in our two approaches is bolded. Um, the act is an examination, and the examination must be systematic. You may be familiar with the term peer review and asking yourself, Aren't peer review and code review the same? Well, yes, but I dislike calling them peer reviews, as Uyghurs and some of the other authors on code review, well, peer review, um, do, because it puts too much focus on the peer that is being reviewed, and not enough focus on the code. By specifying in our nomenclature that we're reviewing code, we very specifically say we care about the code, not about the person. We're reviewing the code and talking about the code, not talking about the person. Moreover, everything is code these days. Architecture and design documents can be expressed in code. 
You do use some kind of configuration management software like Chef or Puppet in your environments, right? Well, those are infrastructure as code. One problem typo somewhere in there could be an almost immediate tenfold cost increase. Throughout this presentation, I'll use these five words. Change, submission, submitter, reviewer, and annotation. These are probably a little bit more easily expressed in context. The submitter proposes changes in a submission, which is evaluated by a reviewer who annotates or accepts it. Carl Wiegers describes his peer review formality spectrum in his book, Peer Reviews in Software. A fantastic book, and I highly recommend that you all read it. Inspection is the most formal of these, these review methodologies, and ad hoc reviews are the least formal. My concept of code review and my team's practice of code review falls somewhere between team review and pair programming. We will, from time to time, allow our pairs to review their own changes at their own discretion. However, our general rule is, if you wrote it, you shouldn't review it. The biggest difference from Uyghur's description is that we don't have formal meetings at the end of our spectrum. Um, our engineering teams at IBM Watson um, have found them to be inefficient at best and excruciatingly painful at worst. Rather, code reviews are conducted at the reviewer's leisure, asynchronously, but not ad hoc. I like to do them in the morning, personally, because it gets me reading other people's code and gets my brain going before I go out and write some of my own. I would say how many of you are familiar with GitHub, um, but assuming since you're here, probably are pretty familiar with GitHub. Um, we use GitHub internally for, our, our, for many of our newer projects. And GitHub's pull request system is a pretty stellar example of a, a good code review system. I'm pretty eager to try out the new review system that was announced yesterday, whenever that gets integrated into GitHub Enterprise. So next, let's talk about some of the, the problems that code review solves. It's pretty clear that the primary, go the primary goal of code review is to find defects before they enter the maintained code base. However, there are two human problems that code review also solves. Code review solves mental model synchronization. You've got five people on your team. Are you certain that they all have a pretty good concept of where the architecture is going, what they're supposed to be doing in the long term? Probably not. Hopefully, they are, they are similar. Code review reduces the feedback cycle so that people can keep their mental model in synchronization with the architecture and the implementation, even as it changes, and it should change over time. With that in mind, they're best equipped to mindfully implement the architecture and provide feedback on its design, as well as to document it. But what if somebody has a different idea entirely, one that's so worth exploring that it could change the architecture? This has happened frequently on my team over the last several months, where discussions on individual lines of code ended up turning into new issues, new pull requests, new features, and new architecture changes. Code review is an excellent way to develop and keep alive tribal knowledge. Tribal knowledge is the sum of stories of what was tried, what was failed, what succeeded, how best to handle certain problems that are commonly faced, and to define a certain sense of how things came to be this way. This is a part of something called architectural oral history. Architectural oral history collapses without a team to keep the culture alive, says Michael Keeling, coworker of mine. Code review, or more specifically, code review systems, enable a major part of that oral history to be written down, made searchable, serving as a reference point or even a starting point for documenting the change of the architecture and the implementation over time. The most review systems will make comments, issues, and whatnot searchable for posterity and encourage reviewers and authors, submitters, um, to 
extract actionable items into new work items, new issues, new pull requests, and so on and so forth. But code review doesn't just help build knowledge of application code anymore. We did talk about infrastructure as code, right? Code review can enable developers to continuously review changes to the infrastructure. And in this way, there's an audit trail with the logic and the discussion around each decision. Code review also thus enables architects, because then the developers and any architects who aren't writing code can continuously review changes to the architecture and the implementation and have that same audit trail with the logic and discussion behind all of those changes as well. Because developers are included in this conversation or can be included in this conversation, the architecture documents should live in the same repository as the code the architecture describes. This allows us or enables us to build knowledge of how things changed over time and how things came to be this way. Thus, code review forces us to write it down and make it searchable. Let's talk about three specific quality attributes that code review ensures. If you value these quality attributes in your architecture, and you should, um, then you should most definitely be doing code reviews. When authors, the original authors of a project move on from that project, um, who's, who's going to care for it? Is it going to live in abandonment? Maybe. If it's inside a company, probably not. Somebody has to maintain it. People are not forever. They move on to other projects. They leave the company. They win the lottery or get hit by a bus. Um, Unfortunately, neither are their minds forever. I, for one, can barely remember what I did last week, let alone a month ago or a year ago. It's vital that an architecture maintains, an architecture values maintainability. So let's talk about that first. To me, value maintainability in an architecture necessitates that the engineers write maintainable code, code that be, can be picked up easily and quickly modified by new developers. It also needs to have a design that is useful and understandable for non-developers, architects, executives, etc. Code review drives all of these. The best way to get somebody acquainted with a, a body of code is to throw them into it, not necessarily from the go make this change and come back and do it again methodology that is commonly espoused, but rather the methodology of come take a look, come take a look at this code with me, pair a review. Because we want them to, because we want them to learn the, the conventions and the patterns and the code base's use of the language in, uh, and the frameworks of the project, as well as the, the other softwares that are being used within it. We want both the initial developers and the maintenance mode crew to understand the goals of the architecture as well as the risks present given the current architectural decisions in the code base today. With this knowledge, they're equipped to deal with the problems on their own terms, quite literally. We want them to be using the same terminology because establishing that vocabulary is necessary in order to make the project learnable. This, project shows, uh, this chart shows the modalities for learning in a reviewing situation. Pairing is great but we need to spend just as much time reviewing in order to transfer knowledge to the next generation of engineers. We need to read solid code, and we need to read code that can be improved. We want to point out problems to solidify problem code, but we also need to have our misunderstandings, our personal type one false positive errors about a problem. Those errors must be corrected by others as a secondary comment to say, hey, no, this is actually correct. That helps us learn in the process. Oh, and that next generation, that's not just a younger engineer that's fresh out of school coming in to fill in for you. It's also some guy taking over for you, some woman taking over for you whenever you move on to something cooler. It's vital to ensure that the developers on a project understand the architecture and the implementation decisions alike. While they may not be involved with every architectural and implementation decision, 
Code review enables them to be aware of changes, to see those pull requests coming in in their inbox. And this enables them to ask questions as the project and the architecture evolve. In doing so, they better understand that architecture and that implementation and are better equipped to, to understand and identify the undesirable as well as the entirely desirable changes to the architecture from the established best plan and best practice. This builds that tribal knowledge ripe for passing to others, including to that executive who is going to grant you a promotion or that investor who's going to drop $20 million on your company. Serviceability focuses on the ability of a technical support team to provide that support. By exposing new configuration, hiding unnecessary debugging configuration, and agreeing on use cases for the project that may fall outside of the primary architectural goals, commonly known as hacking, um, Code Review drives a consensus on what the people supporting the project will be expected to know and do. This also firmly drives documentation. Linus's law applies here from the cathedral and the bazaar. Problems are more likely to be seen if more people looking at the source of the problem. So to me, code review ensures maintainability by encouraging engineers to write code that meets a consensus agreement on maintainability. Code that can be modified quickly, code that can be easily picked up by new developers, and code that is easy for non-developers to understand or really architecture that is easy for non-developers to understand. These quality attributes are all intertwined as well. Service systems that are serviceable are understandable. Systems that are understandable are learnable. My first programming job out of school was with a business-to-business -business imprinting company. Um, we used Subversion. It was pretty cool at the time. Our engineering process was interesting. Though, and I say interesting with kind of a negative connotation there. Um, it was largely do this thing, now go do another thing, now go no, do, do another thing. Oh, and don't break the build. But we didn't really have a reliable build system. It was easy to switch off. I didn't have to deal with production bugs because the company didn't want us to work outside of regular business hours. Um, this should blow your mind. Blew my mind too. The rare outages were the responsibility, the sole responsibility of the sole person in our team who was responsible for working outside of hours, our tech lead. Because he wasn't reviewing any code, any time there was an outage, it took him hours and hours to resolve it because he would end up having to look through the change history, look through the code to try to find that obvious error. The lack of code review in this company was a very clear problem. Those outages were rare, but um, as I said, they were generally um, one letter change or one bad line of code. After a few months, or a few months after I left, one guy cost the company thousands of dollars in lost revenue because he left his own email address in a, vi in a variable instead of referencing an environment variable. This mistake was in place for four months before it was caught, when the, the CEO was like, why haven't we gotten any sales for that new thing? Unfortunately, that developer was fired, despite this being his first and only mistake, and one that would have easily been caught by code review. Secondly, code review ensures compliance. You do have more than one person on your team who is familiar with Section 508, WAIS, ARIA, internationalization, globalization. A code review not only aids in compliance with these very highly expected things, um, but it also can teach others some of the best practices of these things, thereby expanding the number of people who are qualified to write the code and ensure that these requirements are met. Code review also drives auditability. Version control can show what changed and the reason for the change, but it doesn't describe the decisions that were dropped. You know the phrase, history is written by the victor? Well, on projects, Git history is written by the victorious commit. Idiomaticity, there's a new word for you, is the quality of using the tools chosen for the project 
in the best way they were designed to be used. Ever seen um, Java that looked like C, Lisp littered with lets, all kinds of mutatable variables in your Scala? These, violations, these are violations of the idioms that these tools and languages prescribe. Idiom violations can make for less performant code and often less readable code. Writing idiomatic code enables the compiler or the interpreter to run the code as it was really originally designed to be done. This produces faster and more maintainable code. My second job out of school was a consulting role as an applications engineer. First time I'd had an engineer in my title. The lack of control and review cost us a lot of time and money. From customers, technical people going in and messing around with the configuration that we had so carefully crafted and then not owning up to it, um, to not having enough of an audit trail to sufficiently point the finger when there was a compromise at a government facility, although we had no evidence that it was ever exploited. My first professional code review experience was a group meeting. Uh, Uyghurs calls them for formal inspections. It was very painful. Um, I was the, the subject matter expert in the back of the room saying, no, 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 you're doing it all wrong. And unfortunately, I developed a tool that enabled this group to do code review on my part of the project, a multi-million dollar, I think it was a hundred million dollar project. Imagine this, if you will, um, but with almost everybody looking at their mobile or their laptop. And that guy that's just like chilling back there, that's me. A little bit angrier, though. Everyone wanted to get ahead. I didn't blame them. But the incentives in that team weren't aligned. The employees got lots of overtime while already making pretty lucrative salaries for the DC area. Contractors and subcontractors who exhausted their budget ended up having to do free work just so that they wouldn't look bad and be made to look bad by the other contractors. The waste was pretty real. A group inspection involving two employees, one subcontractor, me, and seven contractors would cost four, co for four hours per week, cost taxpayers nearly $6,000 per week, or almost $300,000 per year for a horribly inefficient code review process. The project did eventually launch, but by many metrics was not successful. The primary contractor lost the renewal. Most of that waste could have been eliminated through a better code review process. The formality of the inspections may have been a symptom rather than the source of the problem, um, but I wasn't party to the discussions that actually mandated them, nor did I have any say in the process that was going on. Thirdly, of the quality attributes, and lastly, of the quality attributes. Code review ensures security. We want to spot vulnerabilities before they ship and teach a defensive posture. The defensive posture part is especially critical to teach new developers. Linus's law applies equally to security as it does to other parts of the, the quality attribute spectrum. But the best way to keep bugs and vulnerabilities out of the code is to call out unnecessary features, unnecessary bells and, wh bells and whistles, excuse me. You ain't gonna need it. In this situation, reviewers are like your lawyer. You know, the person who you run something by that sounds kind of stupid and they say, yeah, that's stupid, don't do that, but then you go and do it anyway. Next, some tips. When should you integrate code review? Couple of places. Because the structure of an architecture eventually mirrors that of the developing organization and vice versa, Conway's law, it is vital that an architecture include code review as not only a technical, a technical requirement at the same level of choice as a, a language or a framework or an interprocess communication methodology, but also as a project requirement that describes how the members of the project are expected to interact with each other and provide feedback to strengthen the project and the architecture and the implementation. According to the best kept secret of code review, a case study at Cisco Systems found that there was negligible difference between, or neg negligible difference in the number of defects found through a formal inspection process and through what we call code review. 
<coughs> excuse me. Because there's no difference, informal reviews should be favored because they are faster and more efficient. They found also that the ideal review size should not exceed 400 lines of code. So let's think about some other tips. Firstly, code review should occupy units of work. That is, if your team is using story points or some other system to estimate effort necessary to complete a task, also estimate the time necessary to go through the code review process. My team uses a Fibonacci story point system. Most of our reviews are one or two points. If it's a big change or a potentially controversial change, we'll increase the number of points to uh, account for the back and forth that's going, to, that's going to occur. Accept that not everything is perfect. A good code review system will enable reviewers or submitters to create new issues, new work items, quickly and easily, directly in line. GitHub feature request. Identify areas that see a lot of changes and understand why that is. There's a whole field of study dedicated to understanding churn in software development, so don't get too deep into it, but still understand it. It's also very important not to be petty. Keeping it professional and learning when to speak in person rather than angrily typing out a comment is very vital. But most of all, make progress. Don't let reviews slow down development unnecessarily. If you find that they're getting backed up, dogpile the reviews. Don't write any new code until the reviews are completed, or at least stable. These are some of the things that my team looks for in general when we're, when we're reviewing our code. We're mostly a Scala shop, although we do get into Java sometimes as, necess as necessary. Certain projects have certain concerns, so I'm sure that um, other languages, other stacks, excuse me, other stacks have their own separate concerns. I must, however, stress the value and importance of automation here. A few months ago, my team integrated style checking um, to a newer project that we had just not done at the start of it like we should have. Um, the amount of time that our pull requests spent in code review went down considerably because we stopped arguing over the one thing that everybody was easy, everybody found easy to find, white space. Most importantly, does it work? And is it tested? Those are the things we care about the most. Lastly, let's talk about some limitations of code review. Code review cannot really easily expose how the code changes, how the proposed changes affect the runtime environment. Reviewers are certainly encouraged to download and execute the code, run the tests, see how it works on their own machine. But doing this too often can significantly slow down that reviewer. They're better off going and visiting with the submitter, pairing together to say, hey, let's run the tests in your environment. Sure, this introduces environmental problems, but those are things that should be caught in your regression builds or your continuous integration system. Reviewers must learn when to communicate in person. Constantly writing comments back and forth, 386ing, if you will, um, can really draw out reviews. It's one thing to, um, to talk in person. You can also talk through Hangouts, Skype, whatever you have. Um, but it's still useful to consider or reference that online conversation whenever you need to do code examples or hyperlinks. Lastly, a code review cannot solve political problems. Code review will not get your boss off of you, it will not get QA off of you, and it most certainly will not stop layoffs. In fact, code review can sometimes be a barrier to one's own ownership of their contributions. A reviewer with an agenda could effectively block another submitter through combative or unnecessary annotations, or to steal credit for their own submission by simply slightly reworking it and submitting it as their own and using administrative privileges to delete the other one. One woman developer cited this as her reason for leaving a company, later filing lawsuits against the company, alleging sexism. She held that a coworker she snubbed romantically blocked her work and would waste time altering it needlessly. This put, probably put them behind schedule. 
a counter to this very specific problem, ensure that no one reviewer is a bottleneck, no single point of failure and ensure that multiple reviewers can and actually do review any one submitter's code. So that's about it. But you don't have to take my word for it. Microsoft Research published a paper in 2013, Expectations, Outcomes, and Challenges of Modern Code Review, a part of which asked developers for their motivations for, per for performing code reviews. Their definition of code reviews matches very closely with the one that I cited earlier. From this, we can observe more empirically some of the outcomes from code review. All of these are desirable, and thus code review should be desirable and a part of your process. We've talked about the definition of code review, and my, my new definition is the systematic examination of proposed changes to a code base. We've talked about the problems that code review solves, modeling and knowledge sharing. We've talked about the primary quality attributes that code review ensures, maintainability, compliance, and security. And lastly, we reviewed some of the tips, suggestions, and caveats about how best to do code review. So please, go forth and review code. But before you do, I, of course, do have to do a shameless plug for a community I organize, Pittsburgh Code and Supply. Uh, we're Pittsburgh's largest group of software developers. We just held abstractions, a 1,500-person conference, multi multidisciplinary conference with nearly universal praise. We'll be doing another smaller event in 2017, so please keep your eyes peeled for that. I'm Colin Dean, and thank you for listening. I think we have some time for questions. We've got about seven minutes for questions. I think we've got a microphone here. I'll pull it out. Oh, we want people to hear you. Hey, thanks for the talk. That was excellent. Um, I uh, just had a question. Uh, are your experiences mostly from uh, co-located teams? And uh, does any of this change for remote teams or distributed teams? Excellent question. Does, um, does this change for um, remote teams? Um, I haven't worked specifically on a fully remote team um, in a while, actually. I have worked with several open source projects that did, obviously did have a, a very remote team and found that um, our, the, the methods that we use there didn't really deviate a whole lot from what we use for our co-located team. Um, it's obviously easier to um, throw a boot at somebody or to go and pat them on the back when they're you know, 10 feet away from you. Um, but that same level of praise, the same level of, um, I don't want to use the word confrontation because it sounds confrontational, but um, it's still fully possible through text-based systems. And um, I, I can honestly say that the, the last time that I worked on a, a very large team that was, that was distributed working on an open source project, um, video chat was a thing, but it wasn't as nice as it is, as it is now. So everything was through IRC. Um, we used, uh, there, there's a um, thing called a, a, a exclamation point M, bang M. It's like a motivational thing. And it's like a nice way to say, like, hey, this is really good or to talk things out in public um, while maintaining, maintaining decorum. That's a, a very important part of saying, like, hey, I think you can improve this, and carrying that conversation in a way that others can contribute to it as well. Certainly. Any other questions? Anybody? Go forth and review code. <laughs> <laughs>